Okay, uh, I'll just get started here. I would also like to thank the organizers, Wei Chung and Chelsea, as well as Carol and the tech team for their coordination, Kathy for helming this, and Professor Wu for moderating this panel. My talk today will provide an overview of the approaches that exhibitions have taken to uh, exhibiting contemporary Chinese art. Now I'm approaching them as someone who is very interested in how histories are narrated. And because the field of contemporary Chinese art in general, but also as a scholarly field is still young, I'm interested in how these approaches can help us think about uh, productive ways of writing future histories. Uh, as such, my focus is not on kind of intricacies of behind the scenes work of these exhibitions, but instead about the broader frameworks and points of intervention that each curator attempted to make through their exhibition, asking, for example, what gaps did they perceive and then how did they address this? I will not be assessing how successfully or not a curatorial agenda was carried out in relation to a physical exhibition. For example, what did the wall text say or installation design do? Instead, I attend to the objectives and ambitions as laid out by the curators, particularly as they were laid out in the exhibition catalogs. And for this reason, I have to thank everyone in advance for your patience. There is There are quite a few quotes uh, in this presentation. Um, so thank you for um, bearing with me on that. All of the exhibitions have substantial catalogs uh, serving in conjunction with and effectively as an exhibition's afterlife. These, ex these catalogs enable greater textual nuance and have become indispensable in pushing forward critical approaches for growing a scholarly field. And as indicated by the title of my talk, these exhibitions all attempted to define undefine and redefine both what was contemporary and Chinese uh, in the art. Now, over the course of the past two and a half decades, these exhibitions have uh, unfurled and they often are uh, unfolding in terms of conversations with each other. So exhibitions that cite preceding exhibitions. And this helps us to match, map out the very conscious ways in which exhibitions were building upon each other. While sometimes offering conflicting or contrasting viewpoint from the one before it, I think it's important to not only track a trajectory and ideas and pressure points for thinking about contemporary Chinese art from 1999 to 2018, but also ultimately seeing all of these expressions together as additive and generative, ultimately offering multiple coexisting ways of narration. These exhibitions are important because they contribute to even broader discourses as well. And here I just show you a very, very, very small sampling of the texts that have come to agitate for thinking about curating, a uh, particular light of how exhibitions enact, partake, and often seek to correct imbalances that have arisen with globalization, as you see in the top right, um, terming this curatorial activism. How to think about exhibitions as staging the world, problems of othering, and the entrenched Western centrism present in understandings of so-called global contemporary art. You see on the right, the lower right, texts that argue for exhibitions function as key players in actually constituting contemporary art, as well as the concurrent growth in exhibition histories as constituting art histories. Now, seeing these exhibitions as part of this broader discourse helps to situate the accretion of different approaches to historicizing contemporary Chinese art. And woven through this talk, I sprinkle in excerpts from exhibition reviews, for example, from Freeze Magazine and the New York Times to show the constant thrumming of a Western-centric view for how these exhibitions were received. The denunciations of contemporary Chinese art as derivative of Western art and the constant return to a Western center help us then to not see these exhibitions not just as conflicting viewpoints with each other on how to narrate contemporary Chinese art, but actually ultimately unified in their efforts for making visible histories and ways of seeing that they saw as erased. 
Now, while contemporary Chinese art exhibited in Europe, Australia, and had smaller exhibitions in North America in the early 1990s, Inside Out was heralded as the first major survey of contemporary Chinese art in the US. The guest curator Gao Ming Lu, in his curatorial essay, was able to respond to some of the concerns that he already saw brewing in the Western reception of contemporary Chinese art in Europe, during the early and mid 1990s. He asks, for example, for audience members to not see contemporary Chinese art as monolithic, to not just adopt a Cold War ideological viewpoint, but instead see the art um, as transnational, given the turn in the 1990s to these international institutions and global markets. Nevertheless, as a landmark survey, he also recognized the challenges and necessity of corralling the 80 plus artworks into a legible narrative for Western audiences. This wasn't even uh, easy given that he selected works from Hong Kong, Taiwan, overseas Chinese, uh, and uh, but though largely with a focus on mainland China. In his essays, he largely hinged the themes on identity and modernity with the narrative largely focused on uh, the immediate kind of past two decades, uh, which he says the last two decades have witnessed momentous economic, social, and political changes in mainland China and throughout the Chinese world. The decade-long perspective in this exhibition is intended to provide the viewer with a sense of the unprecedented pace of economic, social, and political change in the region. In this way, this kind of linear history then this immediate history, recent history, becomes the way of talking about cultural changes as ways of thinking about the vast and accelerated economic, social, and political changes. Within the linear history that he gives of mainland Chinese art, this is largely told through very politically charged artwork that he cites as being cynical, prone to self-exile, and within um, uh, themes such as anti-utopian. Uh, and I think Gao Ming Lu does a huge service to the field by laying down what ultimately becomes a narrative that then other exhibitions try to intervene in. Uh, and so this landmark exhibition really paved the way for the other uh, works that we'll see. Now, as I mentioned before, I want to also share an excerpt of a review as this gives you a sense of the evaluative frameworks and viewpoints on contemporary art. Uh, here um, from Freeze, uh, uh, in a short excerpt that reads, the work is too often turgid and uncritically adopted of Western artistic frameworks. The show tells us something about the pitfalls facing Chinese artists whose work at its worst veers between the tediously derivative and the hopelessly provincial. I'm not convinced that the homogenization of contemporary art is so desirable, unquote. Now, I think that this assessment of the exhibition is less about the exhibition itself and more about the prevailing view of contemporary art as this reviewer sees it, where the seeming adoption of what feel like familiar visual forms, formats and mediums even, meant that contemporary art was homogenizing. This subscribes to a monocultural view that denies the particularity, specificities, agency, and contribution of the artist, and instead recenters Western art as the original, with everything else as really laid out here, derivative. This continued to code contemporary art distinctly as the purview of the West. And spoiler alert, this view doesn't go away. Now, other exhibition reviews heralded the show as being eye-opening, with contemporary Chinese art exploding onto the scene in New York with all of its radical, dynamic, and yes, subversive form and content. But the concretization of this perspective had an air of catering to Western viewpoints as people wondered if this understanding of contemporary Chinese art too easily fed into the Western imagination of Chinese art as only ever anti-authoritarian, politically charged, brash and flashy. And Jerome Silbergeld identified this vein as he saw the concretization of inside out artists uh, in the decade between Inside Out and his show in 2009. Uh, he saw the concretization and canonization of inside out artists uh, with the explosion of the art market. Uh, in the mid 2000s. Now in 2009, Jerome Silbergel took this up in his exhibition, 
outside in. We see this very deliberate response and uh, what comes up very clearly in his uh, exhibition uh, curatorial essays. His essays in the catalog and furthermore in a second publication of the symposium proceedings do the work of identifying the power of exhibitions like Inside Out. And with his own exhibition as a form of curatorial and historiographical intervention, Outside In took on two uh, salient points. The questioning of what constituted contemporary Chinese art and broken down further, what was Chinese about it? The focus on, as we see even on the cover of Inside Out, what is actually more prevalent is that subtitle, New Chinese Art. So Rome Silverfield really took issues with the idea that only particular kinds of new Chinese art had been spotlighted in the decade uh, since Inside Out. And the narrative that also accompanied this put forth by Gaoming Lu and others in the late 1990s, early 2000s to Silbergeld left no room at all for more explicit connections to what he called traditional arts, which he considered, quote, uh, whose role is to creatively extend and preserve the past, developing it sufficiently to keep it vital and healthy rather than trying to subvert it, unquote. The exclusion of artists that uh, identified more or connected more to a traditional art form then limited the focus uh, of, of new Chinese art on a very small group of self-identified or curatorially identified experimental artists. To Silbergeld, this not only was a narrow narrative where part had come to stand for the whole, he says, but also did a great disservice to people's understandings of the incredible diversity and historical complexity of what should be considered contemporary Chinese art. And the repercussions of this he saw uh, as reviewers were continuing Western centric viewpoints on, for example, exhibitions of contemporary ink painting that these reviewers saw as boring because they weren't didn't give that kind of flashy, radical, legible uh, narrative that they saw in other types of contemporary Chinese art. Now, the second salient issue raised by the exhibition expands even further, and is the questioning of what falls under the category of Chineseness. What makes something Chinese? So the exhibition proposed a push against any kind of essentialization. Uh, Jerome Silverbelt uh, limited the exhibition to just six artists uh, in a focus on more individual voices and really that emphasis within the exhibition, but also within the exhibition catalog, as well as that symposium proceedings, really gave room for a lot of the voice of the artist, as well as a lot of um, contextualization of individual artist stories. And that was one way of pushing back against uh, what he saw happening with these survey exhibitions like Inside Art. His choice of artists also pushed back against any kind of uh, kind of ethnic emphasis or way of defining Chineseness. Picking, for example, Michael Cherney, uh, a, a person who was a white American who now lives in Beijing, um, but looks very deeply at Chinese landscape tra uh, traditions and making albums with photographs uh, except for, that you see on the right, as well as artists like Vanessa Tran, who was conceived in Vietnam, born outside of Seattle. And Silvergeld writes, quote, she never thought much of her art as being Asian, let alone somehow related to Chinese art, until I suggested it to her in conjunction with planning for this exhibition. This way in which the exhibition itself then was uh, finding these connections was a way of then expanding and stretching what we might think of as contemporary Chinese art. And really, that idea of what was considered traditional really bounced between this ineffable feeling of aesthetic connection like he saw in Vanessa Tran's work and a deep engagement with Chinese art history like he saw in Michael Cherney's work. This stretching of understandings of contemporary and Chinese uh, is I consider very ambitious and provocative. And as he points out in the title of the exhibition and throughout the catalog, the artists in his exhibition are all American citizens. So we have Chinese times 
American Times Contemporary Art. And I appreciate very much so that uh, in addition to the question of what makes Chinese art Chinese, he raises the corollary question, what is American about American art? That in defining and thinking about Chinese art, we should also attend to an undefined American art. And this way then of broadening and reaching out beyond just a narrow discourse is very much, um, I think, this way of thinking more about the implications of globalization and how to then rethink categories that are trying to uh, define and divide. Now, a year and a half later, the curator of Chinese art, Hao Sheng at the MFA of Boston, opened the show Fresh Ink. For this exhibition, uh, which was planned over a period of five years, Hao Sheng selected 10 artists who he had previously identified from their earlier work as already interested in art history, particularly Chinese art history. Uh, and he invited them to the MFA Boston to look through the permanent collection and create a work in response, often through a residency in Boston. The two works then were uh, the original source of inspiration and the resulting work were exhibited in the exhibition. And these are the 10 artists that he chose. You can see the overlap of Arnold Chang and Liu Dan here as well, which is an interesting kind of expansion in some ways on um, uh, or also just a multiplicity of ways of thinking about these artists um, that we saw earlier. Now, what's interesting is Hao Zheng talks about the, uh, the exhibition as coming from two convictions. First, that the MFA is home to one of the most important collections of early Chinese paintings outside of China, and its significance warrants renewed attention. The second conviction behind and fresh ink is that Chinese art is not only the past, but also the future, continuously evolving tradition, and that having activated the MFA's permanent collection to the brushes of contemporary artists, the museum is participating in its ongoing uh, formation. Haoshan continually comments on activating the permanent collection of making accessible and making people see it anew. That is by understanding that artists, contemporary artists, look at the works in new ways. Uh, that is a way for us to also look at the permanent connection, collection and think of these things as uh, resonant and relevant to contemporary life. Now, uh, often, I think this is interesting because oftentimes contemporary art is identified with independent curators and biennialization where individuals are free of being stewards of an existing collection. And we might see the first exhibition curated by Gaoming Lu as an example of this uh, kind of non-institutional curator. But what we see in Fresh Ink and Ink Art at MFA Boston and the Met res respectively, there's a different side to this where they show the particular considerations that so-called encyclopedic museums have to their own collections. And Haosheng also talks about ways in which then this can make people rethink, uh, again, their permanent collection, where understanding that Western audiences have this so-called romantic China of the past in their mind when they go see um, shows at the MFA Boston. But there are ways in which this uh, exhibition, Fresh Ink, might help to disrupt that. For example, Liu Shadong, who identifies violence in a Ming Dynasty scroll as a way then of addressing violence in contemporary times, may be a way of disrupting that. Now, what is also interesting is that Arnold Chang, an artist that he picks, um, is of course a Chinese American artist who uh, staunchly identifies, of course, as American, as somebody who grew up in the United States. And he uh, chose Jackson Pollock as uh, he deviated from picking an ink painting, which Haoshan had originally kind of asked artists to do. Uh, instead, Hao, uh, uh, Arnold Chang picked Jackson Pollock. And he says then, uh, this is a way for people to hopefully uh, as uh, so Arnold Chang says, I am American born and for me it's most valid to choose an old master who's American and says my hope is that people will learn a little bit more about Chinese painting and also look at Pollock a little closer too. And in fact, the exhibition of the painting of Jackson Pollock's uh, painting number 10 usually is up on the wall, but uh, for this exhibition they laid it out like a hand scroll. Uh, and I think in that way, then, we see this very deliberate attempt to have conversations that are two ways, not just how artists in the present are influenced by the past, but really how the past can be see, seen anew 
through uh, present eyes. And indeed, uh, over the unfolding of the exhibition, we also see uh, ways in which with uh, Arnold Chain selection, the ways in which hopefully abstract expressionism can also be seen anew when we think about ways in which um, painting uh, painters, uh, Chinese painters are thinking about Chinese painting. I think something else that's instructive is that the unfolding of the exhibition over the course of five years maybe began with one curatorial vision, but the revision of that over time shows us that one vision has to be revised and will not uh, may not accommodate or fit the uncontrolled outcomes that uh, come out of these encounters uh, that uh, contemporary artists have, and they may not easily fall in line. And so the encompassing of the show and encompassing of that kind of history and its implications as told through the kind of lifespan of that exhibition and its production um, shows some of that. Now, the next uh, exhibition I'll talk about is Ink Art, Past as Present. And on their, uh, in the catalog and on their website, they talk about this as the first major exhibition of Chinese contemporary art mounted by the Metropolitan. As we know that it took place in 2014, uh, it was put on by the Chinese art department uh, and it preceded, of course, the 2016 opening of the Met Ployer. And so it took place within actually the China, China galleries. There were around 70 artworks um, from the 1980s onwards and 35 artists represented. The four sections of the exhibition were the written word, new landscapes, abstraction and beyond the brush. And in some ways, this kind of idea of going beyond the brush is somewhat uh, reminiscent, I think, of the efforts even in Outside In where the definition of ink art, like the ways in which Silvergeld was setting tradition uh, can sometimes be indirect and sometimes be quite indirect. And so you really have to broaden those ideas. Uh, I think what's really interesting here, I won't read out loud given the amount of time, is that the framework put forth by Mike Hearn is that uh, we can't just see this, uh, this contemporary Chinese artwork as uh, within kind of just the the brief linear past, the shortened period of recent history, but instead needs to be seen within a larger, what he calls a larger pattern of cultural renewal. In this sense, then, it's really a much larger framing of uh, the present within a Chinese uh, idea of thinking about history as cyclical. There's a sense then that unlike in Fresh Ink, where the present allows us, doesn't make us necessarily think Unlike in Fresh Ink, ink art, I think, doesn't really make us think about the past in new ways, but rather make us look at the present in new ways, as seen in the subtitled show, Past as Present. Uh, in, the exhibition, in the exhibition review from the New York Times, we see here, again, a very kind of similar uh, vibe of how to talk about this work as a Chinese spin on familiar art making strategies, where Roberta Smith cites, you know, Rachel White Reed, Jeff Coons, um, William Kentridge as uh, ways of, uh, as, you know, ways of, 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 of thinking about the works that you might see in ink art. And I think that actually given this trajectory and given the larger context, I don't think that she is citing them as contemporaries of these Chinese artists who can all equally take, play, uh, take from the same reservoir of techniques, but instead a localized instantiation of what other artists have already been doing. And I wanna uh, finally say here, Mike Hearn talks about his exhibition as, um, appreciated from, he says, these works may also be appreciated from this perspective of global art, but by examining them through the lens of Chinese historical artistic paradigms, layers of meaning and cultural significance that might otherwise go unnoticed are revealed. Now, I think it's interesting that he makes these connections back through what he sees as a continuum. And 
But what is really notable here is that he contrasts it in relation to global art perspectives. I think that the ideas put forth in ink art should not be seen as separate from global art, but rather a really important intervention in how global art has been perceived. The assumption here is that a global art perspective focused on the immediate context for a work, perhaps only contextualized within the past decade or two. Uh, but to expand global art beyond this, to see this lens of past is present as global and as contributing to understandings of global intervening in it helps us to place the exhibited art as within a model of both and rather than either or. And in this way, it's a way of decentering the global by emphasizing a spatio-temporal context that helps to also open up the limited ways in which global perspectives has been uh, conceived. And I'll actually end my presentation here in the interest of time. But if people are interested in um, the Guggenheim show, we can talk about that more in the Q&A. Thank you.